It is 3.30. Welcome, everybody, to the invited talk by Robert Krautkammer. My name is Kurt Melhorn. It's a pleasure for me to introduce, to chair this session and to introduce Robert Krautkammer. Robert is professor and department head at Weizmann Institute in the computer science department of Weizmann Institute. He is interested in algorithms, analysis of algorithms. More specifically, big data sets, data analysis, combinatorial optimization, approximation algorithms, routing, and peer-to-peer -peer networks. He published widely, he's cited widely. He's currently editor-in-chief of Science Journal of Computing and also chair of the computer science department at Whitemans. Bobby, please start your talk. Yeah, thank you. Let me uh, share my slides, your screen. Okay. Thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, I hope you can all uh, see the slides. So first, uh, let me uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. I was very excited for the opportunity to present uh, this topic. I think it's an exciting topic, fascinating topic. And also for the opportunity, I was very excited about the opportunity to, uh, you know, visit China, which I've never been before. <laughs> and then it got cancelled. I said, okay, so maybe I'll visit Zaroboken, which I've never been before too. But then this got cancelled, yada, 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 and we're all at home. So I hope uh, uh, you're having a good time at iCalp here. Uh, and here we are. So I want to talk about graphs and sketching and combinatorial optimization. So basically the uh, uh, framework that I have in mind is that we have a lot of data, like I call it in this slide, big data. And what we usually want to do is somehow compress it into a small object so that we can laser it, later use that smaller object to really process, continue processing or querying our data, in, in examining our data. So this is common in, in let's move, okay, yeah, in, in many uh, areas from cloud computing, mobile computing, distributed computing, we need these things because these small objects are easy to store, they're easy to communicate, uh, they have a lot of advantages. Um, and in general, I think this is a fascinating area because there's an interplay between the combinatorial optimization or the kind of combinatorial problems we want to solve on this data. And I think I'm thinking mostly about graph problems and sort of like information theory because you want to store or, or send this data using like a, uh, a using a few, as, many, as few bits as possible. So that's sort of like an information theory bottleneck happening here. So I call this whole approach sketching, which is just in this context of, uh, in the meaning of data summarization, okay? It's not a, like a technical term at the moment. Uh, and I think there are like many exciting results. I'll try to survey them and, and mention here and there where are the open problems and uh, more like in terms of direction, but sometimes also specific ones. So the context, I have, the context I have in mind is the following. Uh, we have a graph G. We want to solve some problem on this graph G. Let's say the graph has N vertices throughout to the, the talk. And we want to solve some uh, optimization problem. Now, that optimization problem refers to some, I call it here a query Q, maybe like a pair of vertices in the graph. And we want to solve some optimization problem on, the, on the, uh, these two vertices. So one example could be minimum distance between two, pair, two vertices in the graph. That's the second example. The first example I want to mention here is like the minimum cut between these two vertices in the graph. Okay, so I'm going to use actually, so these are like two very simple problems, well known, they're really optimization problems because you want to find the minimum solution. And uh, throughout the talk today, I'll focus actually on cuts and not about distances, but there are many uh, papers about uh, similar questions involving distances. So we're going to talk about cuts. And in this paradigm, instead of really working with the graph G, we want to work with the smaller object. So somehow we take this huge graph G, we sketch it, that's what the term I'm going to use, sketch it into a small object. So here it's, you know, the sketch of G. And then we want to evaluate the query or compute whatever we want to compute on the sketch and not on the graph. So we want to use the sketch and evaluate the query. Together we get either a solution or an estimate for the solution. And the point is, again, is that it's using the sketch and not the input graph. So you can think of like the first arrow in this uh, blue arrow that you can see here is like a pre-processing step 
where you preprocess the graph into something as much smaller object, and then you evaluate your queries on this smaller object, smaller in terms of bits. Okay, so if you want to store it, if you want to communicate it, uh, coordinate between different sites, and so on. Okay, so let's start with the example I gave, which is minimum SD card. So this uh, problem was actually studied, not in this terminology, but it was studied in uh, the 1960s. And there's a famous result by uh, Gomori and Hu that says if you have a, you fix a graph G, so throughout I'm gonna think about undirected graphs and they can have edge weights, which are interpreted as capacities, right? Because we're talking about cuts. So in a fixed graph G, you wanna look at all possible minimum SD cards. So all possible, I mean, for all pairs S and P. So we have, and vertices, we have about N squared, like N choose two pairs S and P. So we wanna look at N choose two minimum cuts, and you can actually represent all these N choose two minimum cuts by one tree on the same vertex set, so on the same N vertices, and you have the guarantee that the value of the minimum, what you see here in red, is that the value of the minimum cut in the tree is equal to the value of the minimum cut in the graph. So if you want to, like query the value of the minimum cut for a pair, you don't really need to know G, it's enough to know the tree T. And uh, this actually has like a stronger property, you can actually recover the cut in the sense of like the bipartition of the vertices. But let's not go into these details right now, but it is true. And let me give you an example what it means to have the same value of the cut in G and in the tree. It's very simple, this example is very simple. You have a, a clip with unit weights, so then, if the graph G is a click with unit weights, any two vertices can be separated by a cut of cost capacity N minus one, because you just take one of these vertices and disconnect it by deleting all the incident edges. So if degree is N minus one, that's the minimum cut actually. And you can use a tree, which is actually a star with uh, N minus one leaves and edge weights N minus one on every edge. And again here for every two vertices, and you map the vertices in some manner, it doesn't matter which manner, but for every two vertices, the minimum cut in the, in the star, every two vertices, the minimum cut is n minus one. It's the same minimum cut value. And this is a tree. So it's much smaller in terms of like storage. Instead of n squared edges, you get order n edges. And that's true for every tree, of course. So you reduce the size of the sketch to order n compared to the input graph, which was order n squared. And this is like a very strong redundancy, right? It's like quadratic. Redundant, we, we see that there is quadratic redundancy in the graph in, in this terms of these queries that we want to evaluate. And notice that as you see on the top, there are actually n square or n choose two different queries, but it, you can answer all of them using only order n uh, size object. And notice that this object is, uh, gives you exact answers. You, there's no loss, even though you reduce the size of the storage, you do not lose because of approximation or anything. And everything is deterministic, like you can make, say, all the n squared queries, and it's not like you are correct only with some probability. So this is very strong, very surprising, I think. It's very succinct data structure. And let me tell you a little bit, uh, because it's so fundamental, let me tell you a little bit about the algorithm that uh, computes this, this the now called the Gomorrah algorithm. So the algorithm, it works in iterations, but let's start with the first iteration. You have all the vertex set, you think of it as a super node. So you have like a one super node that contains all the vertices V. And I want to split it into two, V1 and V2. The way to do it, you pick arbitrarily two vertices, you call them S and T, you compute a minimum SD cut. It splits that uh, V into the cut, splits V into two sides, two parts, you call them V1 and V2. So you partition the super node into two. Now you put an edge between this V1 and V2, and I didn't try it here in the picture, but the weight of that edge is going to be the capacity of the cut that you found. So this is recovering one edge now. Now you want to keep doing that iteratively. So now you pick one of these super, two super nodes, you pick two vertices inside it, <laughs> inside the same, say V2, and you compute the minimum cut between them, not exactly, in, not in V2 and not in G, you need some auxiliary graph that is similar to G, but with some small modifications. You compute the minimum SD cut, and that would split V2 in this case into two smaller super nodes. And then you do the same thing. You have these two super nodes, you create, connect them by an edge. The old edge that went before to V2, that was here, you have to somehow connect either to the, the one of the two new super node that you created. So you have to see how exactly to do that. But that's what you're, you're going to do. That goes on for exactly n minus 1 iterations. After n minus 1 iterations, you revealed, you computed n minus 1 edges. 
and you have going to have exactly n super nodes, and but every super node will have contain only one original vertex. So you're going to get exactly a tree on n vertices. It's a very nice algorithm. Now let's think about what's the running time of this algorithm. Uh, this has n minus one iterations, but every iteration you need to compute a minimum cut, minimum st cut in a graph either g or a variant of g. So this is definitely not linear time. Even if minimum cut took us linear time, which is at the moment is open, we don't know how to do that. So linear time in graphs would mean order m, right? Like the number of edges. So then the overall algorithm would be mn in this Gomorrah algorithm, if we knew how to do minimum cut in linear time. So we want to do either this or even better. And this is open, so there are a lot of questions, interesting questions here. Uh, so I marked it as, as open, and there are different directions to go here. So for example, for example, one of them is how to avoid the minimum cuts. This Gomorrah algorithm uses minimum cuts, but maybe you want to do something else because that's sort of like a bottleneck. Uh, maybe you want to use approximate minimum cut as, as a subroutine. Now, the approximate minimum cut, the upside is we, for one plus epsilon approximation, we do have linear time algorithm. The downside is that this Gomorrah algorithm now breaks because it, it requires uh, something else. Cut. Induction sort of like requires uh, the cut to be exact, optimal minimum cut. So there's a problem here. Uh, there has been progress on, on special graphs, like unweighted graphs, uh, planar graphs, bounded tree width graphs. So uh, there's th I think there's progress, but there's still more to go. In general, the focus of these kind of questions is on faster algorithms. So it's related to what's uh, called fine-grained complexity, which is a topic that Virginia talked in the uh, first uh, day of the conference. Uh, and not on, on space complexity, so I'm not going to dwell uh, on that too much today. So we have this object, and it's going back to the space complexity of the storage that we have. Um, this is very succinct. It's a trick. It's almost as good as it, it, it gets. Um, but it only computes ST cuts. These are only something like N choose two cuts, but the graph is two to the N cuts. Can we do, uh, can we get something that handles more cuts? So here is a different concept uh, due to Reke, and I would call it Reke's tree. I don't know if that's the official name, but I think it's well justified. So he came up with this concept. And uh, the theorem I mentioned here is like slightly improved from subsequent work, the, the, the bound. Uh, you want to represent the graph using a tree. And this tree now, it, it's not on the, ver the same vertex set as G, but the leaves of the tree are exactly the original vertices. But in addition, you can have Steiner vertices. Now in this context, it will not be difficult to see that you're not gonna need more than N or N minus one Steiner vertices. So the size of the tree is still older than, okay? And now the uh, amazing property of this one tree is that for every cut, every cut that you have in the graph, so the cut is, uh, Characterized, you can describe using a set S of vertices, S, S bar. So basically, the, uh, the denominator minimum cut between S and S bar in G is just the capacity of the cut S, S bar in G. And it can be approximated by the same quantity in T in the tree. Now, notice that in the tree, I told you there is S and S bar, so that's the original vertices, but you have also Steiner vertices. So you have to optimize there. You have to decide how to find the best cut in the tree. So basically like map the Steiner vertex to one side of the cut or other, every Steiner vertex. But if you do that, so you compute the minimum cut in the tree, which is a much easier task, then you approximate the original cuts, the, the graphs in the original, the, sorry, the cuts in the original graph within factor, which is only slightly more than log n. Okay, so you have like, you can approximate all the two to the n cuts, or two to the n queries in the graph, using an object which is still of size or the n. It's really, really very succinct, it's just a tree. Uh, so this tree has extra vertices, but also I, I'm not gonna discuss it, but of course, once you have a tree, that's a very, very useful object because on tree, often you can compute your queries or computations very fast. Now this result is existential, there are extensions, like if you wanna compute it in polynomial time, then actually the approximation, as far as what we know today, become like the results that we know today, uh, losing the approximation a little bit has extensions to multi-commodity flow, which 
Many of the results I mentioned today have extensions to multi-commodity flow, but I decide to keep it simple for flows because then you have to define what is a multi-commodity flow, etc. So um, this is amazing. However, the bottleneck that you might want to, we might want to tackle, is this log n factor. Can we get below log n factor? We want a good, a better approximation for for all the cuts in the graph. Okay, so we can do this. However, now we're not going to have a trick anymore. We're going to need a richer structure, a bigger structure. So it's going to be richer, much richer than a tree, but not much bigger. Still going to be of size order n. So remember, we want to have all the cuts in the, represent all the cuts in the graph. So now we can use this, what's called cut sparsifier. So this was introduced by Benzo and Carger in 96. And there were several, many developments and improvements. So I state here in the theorem the strongest result that we know is that for every graph G and every parameter epsilon that uh, we can find a sparsifier, it's called a cut sparsifier G prime. So it's a graph on the same vertex set. It is very sparse. It has only order of N over epsilon squared edges. So in N it's just linear, not even a log N. This was like shaved off. So now we get order N dependence. And the capacities in this G and in G prime, as you can see, is within, within one plus epsilon of each other. So if you want to ask what is the capacity of a certain cut in, in J, you can just do the same calculation in G prime, which is a sparse graph. Okay, up to one plus epsilon, if you're willing to give up this one plus epsilon factor, then you're done. This is a very, very strong um, guarantee. It was suggested initially by Bentzer and Karger explicitly to speed up algorithms. So you start with an algorithm. If you can compute this, which I'm not going to focus on, on this issue, compute it in linear time, Compute it quickly. Then from that point on, you have a, a, a graph which is very sparse. And then you can do all your cut computations. Whatever cut computations you want to do, you can do in this uh, graph G prime, in sparse graph. So again, you have a graph which is only of size order n divided by epsilon squared. And it, it sort of like handles n square, uh, sorry, two to the n many queries, or two to the n sort of like degrees of freedom that you could potentially uh, be interested in. And this has extensions as I um, cited here. It's, it's to spectral specification. So that's another type of extension. Extension I mentioned before, multi-commodity flow. Spectral is in a different direction. I'm actually quite interested. I don't know how come these are like two different separate lines of work. So you can generalize from cuts to spectral. You can generalize from cuts to multi-commodity flow. I don't understand exactly what is the relationship between the two. So if you want like a sort of like a meta question, big open question, I think that's interesting. How come these things are, uh, like the intersection is cuts, but, but what is the relation between these two generalizations of cuts? Either, I mean, it could be that in specific context, there is a good answer and in other specific context, there isn't. Okay, so moving forward, this is a very, very powerful uh, guarantee. And if and then, uh, it's approximation factor one plus epsilon, and you might want to wonder, is this trade-off optimal? I mean, after all the improvements, you still have n over epsilon squared. Can you do better? Like, why not have n over epsilon, actually? Why do you need a square? It sounds very natural, because you see, epsilon equals 1 over n is sort of like a natural breakpoint for like the smallest epsilon you might be interested in, in many cases. Like, the graph is unweighted or something like this. But here, you know, if epsilon is one over root n, you already get a, a graph size of n squared. Right? If epsilon is one over root n, the guarantee that you have from this theorem, uh, here I hope you can see my mouse uh, where I point. So epsilon equals one over root n, you already get uh, like a dense graph, and there's no point going below that. But a natural bar barrier would be epsilon equals one over n. That'd be more natural. So can you do better? Maybe you can get two n over epsilon. Maybe the way to do that is to not represent G using a different graph, G prime, but using something which is non-graphical and non-graph. Some sketch, some image, maybe you take the difference, you take two graphs, you take the difference. The sum of two graphs, like if you add them up on the same vertices, you can say, oh, it's a new graph. But the difference is, is something else, or maybe some other crazy object. So we looked at that. Uh, so this is uh, in work with uh, Andoni, Chen, Shin, Woodruff, and Zhang. And then it was uh, improved a little bit by Carlson and also simplified considerably by Carlson, Kola, Srivastava, and Trevisan. And that shows that basically if you want to have a sketch, arbitrary sketch, anyway you store this 
all the cuts of the graph within approximation one plus epsilon, you need at least n log n divided by epsilon squared bits of space. There exist such graphs that require so many bits of space. So it requires a lot of storage. Okay, this is like an information theoretical lower bound about approximating all the cuts, but up to some approximation one plus epsilon. So that means that you cannot really get uh, better like this. You cannot get, get improve this epsilon square to say one over epsilon uh, al uh, algorithmically or by a sketch. Uh, and in particular, this information theoretic lower bound gives you this corollary written here that says that if you have a cut sparsifier, that cut sparsifier requires at least n over epsilon squared edges for worst case graph G. Why? Because if you could always create a sparsifier with less than these many edges, you can just encode it using few bits because every edge requires only order log n bits to, the, to encode the, the endpoints of the edge and the weight of the edge, etc. So this immediately implies a combinatorial bound on the number of edges. But the, the main point here is that you start with information theory, you really bound the, the amount of information needed to represent all the cuts in any way you want, just information. Okay, so this seems like a answer, like giving a, a closing the question. But then we came up in the same paper with an alternative approach for these cuts. And this alternative approach says, well, maybe it's enough to look at the relaxed requirement. So you sketch the graph, then you make a query. Maybe it's okay to answer with, to be correct with high probability. So high probability, I wrote here three quarters, it could be, you know, 90%. It's actually easy to amplify it by standard arguments of amplification, like repeating order log n times, taking the median, these usual arguments. But this is a probabilistic guarantee. So for, then the point here is that for every cut, you have a high probability of success, but separately for every cut. Now you cannot really do a union bound here. You could do a union bound, but it, you, know, you have to amplify. If you want to do a union bound over to, to the n cuts, you need to amplify it so much that you, know, you have to repeat it n times, basically order n times. And that's of course too expensive because it will increase the storage size by a factor of order n, which is too much for us. So just the name of this thing, we call it for each guarantee. This name comes from compressed sensing compared to the previous concept, which is for all, the, 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 without the probabilistic guarantee. And uh, we were able to show in the same paper that actually for this relaxed guarantee, this for each guarantee, actually you can get storage which is only linear in epsilon. So here there's an O tilde, which means there's an extra polylog in N. So it's not as tight uh, as the previous result in that sense. But in epsilon, the improvement is really linear in epsilon, and it's easy to see that this linear in epsilon is also necessary. So in that sense, like n over epsilon is a lower bound. So this is sort of like bypasses the stronger requirement by making a, this relaxed requirement and designing a sketch that achieves this relaxed requirement with, with smaller sketch. Now, a very interesting aspect here, which again, if we were talking about open problems, so I keep mentioning open problems because I know many people are, uh, interested in open problems, right? That's all the action. People want to work on something. So um, this sketch has a very interesting property that it's non-graphical. It's not a graph. It has a few more steps, etc. But let's say on a conceptual level, the sketch consists of two objects. One is really a subgraph G prime as before, but also it has the list of degrees, the exact degrees from the graph G. So this second object is of size order N, right? So it's not heavy, it doesn't add much to the storage. But now when you want to make a query, you somehow use the two parts of this, this sketch. And it's not just like asking what is the value of the cut in G prime. It's something a little bit more uh, delicate. So that's very interesting. And I don't know the open question. I don't know if you can do something like this using a randomized graph G prime. Right? A graph G prime, but of course it will have to be randomized because every such graph should be good or succeed on a, on a query S with high probability, but not simultaneously on all such S's. This we know cannot happen. Okay, so this approach uh, was then uh, followed with various uh, extensions or this whole line of, of uh, research. So I mentioned already that you can do a, a union, but if you have like amplify this and then you can answer many queries uh, as long as they're non-adaptive because then you can use union bound on this uh, error probability. Uh, probab 
כי זה error probability Uh, extension to spectral I mentioned before, there's extension to uh, directed graphs, assuming there's some sort of like balance, the direction going out from S and the edges going into S are bound by some parameters, say beta, and then everything depends on this beta. And another ex possible extension, which I find to be very, very interesting, is to hypergraphs. Uh, it was sort of like start started in a paper that I had with uh, Dima Kogan, and there were like several follow-ups, but I think uh, even today, there are some open questions there, and I'll touch upon that sort of like a DNA wrap up and somehow it will uh, be relevant. So I think I mentioned that is open because I think here is like the biggest gap. Several problems here or, or bounds are open. Okay, so uh, let me quickly show like a, a application of, of the previous of this for each sketch, this, this weird object that succeeds on every cut separately with high probability, but on every cut separately. So suppose you have two graphs, G1 and G2, and they're like in a distributed setting. So one side has G1, the other side has G2. They're on the same vertex set, and in principle, you want to take the union of the edges. And you want to compute the minimum, global minimum cut on this union. So it's written at the end of this corollary. Uh, so what could you do? The natural thing would be to send the sparsifier of G1 and a cut sparsifier of G2, but then you can, also take the union of these two sparsity files and compute the minimum cut there. And this will give you this, what I wrote here, this one of the epsilon square dependence, because that's what you get from cut sparsity files. Now using these uh, sketches, you can actually get it down to order one over epsilon. How? The search space for global mean cut is like two to the end queries, two to the n possible cuts. So that's too much. We cannot really try all cuts. Uh, this sketch is too weak to answer two to the n queries. But the idea is to first use the cut sparsifiers with epsilon equals 0.1, like a fixed epsilon. And using that, you, you have, uh, you have a, a, like a version of, a sketched, a sparse version of G1, sparse version of G2. You merge them, and from this, you compute approximate minimum cuts, approximate global minimum cuts, say within factor two. And this gives, this is known to have only polynomially many, like order n to the four candidates, approximate minimum cuts. Okay, so you use this first, this cut sparsifier to identify all the n to the four candidates. Then in parallel, you have another type of sketch, which is this for each sketch, the one that has like better dependence on epsilon. And you use that second part of the sketch only on the n to the four candidates that are computed in the first part. Of course, you do it in parallel, but because they're in this, that this way you have in independence and you only need union bound over n to the four different queries that are non-adaptive because you just have to look at all the candidates and find the best one. Each one, you estimate the, the cut value within one plus epsilon using a sketch for G1 and a sketch for G2 and sum up. Okay, so that's an example. Uh, it was maybe a bit too quick, but um, uh, that's not the main point here, I think. So I'll move on. So up to now, we basically talked about sparsifying, the, looking at all the cuts in the graph. Now I want to move to sort of like the second part of the talk where I look at still at graphs and cuts but I want to look at uh, vertices. So if, if there's like a pressing question, maybe now is a good time. And if not, I'm going to come up with like, uh, introduce a new definition. No, okay. So um, in, in this, yeah. Uh, so now what I want to look at is this graph, um, it has, terminals, and I'm going to assume it has k terminals, so if you denote the number of terminals by k, I'm going to assume k is much smaller than n. So it's like a huge graph, maybe like, like the internet or a social network or something, but there's a small set of vertices that I really care about, and these are usually called terminals, and here in this picture, I drew them with like these black circles, okay? And I care about cuts be that between the black circles, like the terminals, which means that you take these black circles, you partition them into two, so in the picture now, I'm gonna make them like yellow and red. I think I hope you can see them. Although in retrospect, red and green are not the best contrast for some people. So I split the terminals into two, and then I find the minimum cut between them. This basically means that I have to optimize then what to do with the non-terminals. The non-terminals could go to either side of the cut, right? The yellow go, let's say on the left, the red on the right, and the greens have to decide where, which part of the cut they go. I wanna minimize the cut. So I'm going to call this the minimum cut in the graph G, 
between S and implicitly the S bar, which now is not the rest of the vertices, it's just the rest of the terminals. So it's like, as you can see, the K minus S, all the other terminals. And this you can think of also as, as maximum flow between S and S bar, like you put like a super source on S and super sink on S bar. So I want to emphasize this is a single, what's called single commodity flow, because you can put a super, super source and super sink. And of course, if the terminals are fixed, every, then every query S is basically an optimization problem because S defines S and S bar and you want to solve like a single commodity flow on them. So now the number of problems I want to solve on this graph is actually two to the K. Okay, so, so big K is the number of terminals, capital K. Little K is the number, the number. So I'm going to use the same, solve like the same letter. So the number is two to the small K, two to the K is the number of cuts I, I'm, worried about. And I'm going to call them terminal cuts because that is the optimization of the terminals. So now suppose I don't want to store them. I don't care about the entire graph. I only care about the cuts of the terminals. These are the important cuts. And it turns out that this concept was studied. Uh, it was named uh, uh, mimicking networks. And another way to think about it is a vertex parsifier. So I want to come up with a, a network G prime, a different graph G prime, whose vertex set is only the terminals, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry a, a graph, a network G prime, which is much smaller, hopefully, but it contains the same terminals, but in this G prime, the cuts that I care about are the same as the cuts in G, okay? So for these two to the K cuts that I have, they have the exact value in G and G prime. Okay, so let me give you a simple example. To make it simple, I chose a three, but of course the interesting graphs are where G is not a tree. So let's say G is on the left, you see this graph, and suppose I care only about the terminals A, B, C. So for cuts that involve A, B, and C, let's look at the edges around A. The edges that are labeled two and five, they are not interesting for cuts between A, B, and C, A, B, C. So I can completely delete them from the graph. Now, if, when I, care about, if I care about cuts between A and say B, C, then I either gonna cut the edge of cost three or the edge of cost nine. But not both, and of course, among the two, I need I, it's better to cut the edge of cost three. So in the mimicking network, I'm going to connect A and B with the edge of cost three. Okay, so this is like a simpler, a smaller graph in this case with fewer edges, fewer vertices. But the minimum cut, say between A and B C, is three. It has cost three exactly as in, in the input graph. So this graph has two to the k queries because I want to look at all subsets of the terminals or two to the k degrees of freedom if you want that I need to handle. And there's a theorem from this uh, that I mentioned, uh, this work that I mentioned by Hagerup, Katayanen, Nishimura, and Ragde that says that every k terminal network has a mimicking network and the size is, well, it on, the good side thing is it only depends on k. But the dependence on k is a little bit disappointing. It's two to the two to the k. So it's doubly exponential in K. Only two to the two K, K vertices. So it has K terminals and a few more, okay, it's a little bit more than few non terminals. So, sort of like you replace N, you can reduce N to this number two to the two to the K. Now, this is exact, you don't lose anything in this uh, transformation. Um, it, it even holds for directed networks, but I'm not going to talk about directed networks. And actually, let me tell you a little bit about the proof because it's very simple. I chose only things that are relatively simple to explain here. So the idea is like this. You have the graph. You have two to the K cuts that you care about. Okay, so every time you have a cut, you basically partition the vertices into two sides, like left and right or something. So if I have a partition to left and right and top and bottom and so on, how many eventual like labels I have on every vertex? Because I want to label a vertex. It's on the left and it's on the top. Etc. So you get like two to the two to the k labels. Right? If you like impose all these partitions simultaneously. So you get two to the two to the k like buckets of labels. You say everything that is in the same bucket or gets the same label, I put them, I merge them into one vertex. That's the whole argument. Why can I merge them into one vertex? Because in every cut, they went to the same bucket, they went together. So I never wanted to separate them. So I might as well like merge them, which is equivalent to putting an edge of, of weight infinity between them, because it was never cut anyway. That's the whole argument, okay, in a nutshell. I mean. Okay, so that's uh, 
make some progress, but the size is two to the two to the k, and we want to do better, right? Okay. However, I don't know how to do better, so that's like another open problem. I really hope somebody can solve this. At the moment, it's doubly exponential. We, uh, when I worked on it, I managed to with uh, Havana Rica, we managed to prove a, a lower bound of two to the omega k. Then it was actually uh, proven independently by Khan and, Khan and Raghavendra. So there's a lower bound of two to the omega k, and the upper bound is doubly exponential. So there's like an exponential gap between them. That's very interesting. Uh, another question is, okay, for general graphs, we don't know how to improve this. Can we improve it for special graph families? So there are certain results about this, like bounded tree with planar graphs, etc. What's open is excluded minor. So usually when you have a result for planar graphs, you say, oh, you know, probably I can do something for excluded minor as well. At the moment, I don't know how to do something similar for excluded minor graphs. Um, another open question in this context is to extend it to multi-commodity flows. Everything here is about cuts. I mean, the mimicking networks is about cuts. Um, and another question, which is, I think, really, really important and fascinating, is how can you get even smaller than, say, let's say, this doubly exponential if I allow you one plus epsilon approximation or order one approximation? So I want to get better at the cost of uh, some approximation. So I want to tell you a little bit about these directions. So let me start with this example of, of uh, planar graphs, okay, on a, in a nutshell. So going back, not talking about approximation, when I talk about planar graphs, and for planar graphs, what we know, as you can see here in the circle, it's singly exponential in K. And there are tight up, but in now tight, almost tight upper and lower bounds. It's not tight, it's quadratic, but we know that it's singly exponential for planar graphs. Okay, so somehow we want to do better than general graphs. So how are we going to use the, the fact that the graph is planar? And as I said, I don't know how to do it for excluded minor. So, so you know, the next slide you'll see, I'm using the planar drawing. So for excluded minor graphs, I probably need completely different techniques. Okay, so what are you going to do? Like, uh, how do you construct a mimicking network for a planar network? So suppose uh, the theorem is that we are, if it's a planar, the graph is planar, then I can actually construct a mimicking network of size roughly 2 to the 2k. And the intuition is that we're going to do an algorithm which is similar to what I've shown you before when you merge whenever possible. So let's see what it means to do whenever possible. It's essentially the same principle, but, but the analysis is different. So when you have this graph, let's denote by this E sub S, the subset of the edges that are exactly the cut that separates S from S, like the minimum cut between S and S bar and break ties, so we can assume it's, it's unique. I, I only need one to like deal with one of them. And now because the graph is planar, it can be drawn in the plane. And then, so, so in this picture that I have here, it's like inside these circles, I have S, the, the part on the side of S, and outside the part of S bar, which I didn't write in the picture. But because it's planar, really these things can be uh, like, uh, you can go around the boundary and they describe the uh, component by going around the boundary, and it's basically like planar duality and using the dual edges to yes. So what's drawn, I'm going to denote it by ES star. And really, these circle cycles that are drawn here are really cycles in the dual planar dual graph. And it's easy to show that uh, these uh, edges form a union of these joint cycles at most k cycles, no more than k, because I only have k terminals I want to separate. So this is like a typical. Uh, picture of E sub S, really of the dual, but okay. Now the algorithm is, you take all these cuts, you draw all of them in the plane. Like if you have a whiteboard, you draw all of them on the whiteboard simultaneously. So that splits the vertices into connected components. So now because I'm looking at the dual, the vertices of the graph are actually inside these uh, white regions, in, uh, you know, uh, inside these cycles. So the algorithm is just remove all these uh, blue edges, or these blue cycles that you see here, you get connected components. And then every connected component, you just contract to one vertex. And that's a new graph. It's going to be smaller graph. And it gives you actually even a minor. It's, it's even planar, of course, because you just contract uh, edges, connected components. The question is, what is the size of this graph G prime that you get? Now, a simple argument shows that, that the, the cuts will not change much, because I'm only contracting things where, uh, like, the cut didn't care about anyway. 
they were never, like two vertices that were never cut anyway. It's the same argument from before. The real, the question is why is this graph, can we bound the size of this graph? And uh, here is like the uh, argument in a nutshell in one slide. So it has two lemmas. So the first lemma, suppose I don't look only at one uh, cuts at E S, but I look at two. So it's E sub S and E sub T. So I have two of them or two like subset of the terminals. And I like draw both of them. So maybe S gave me these two cycles from before and T adds one more cycle. So the question, how many connected components do I have now if I remove these two together? Now, naively, you might think that you say, well, the first time, like you just remove ES, the vertex at V is partitioned into up to like K parts. That's what I said before. Now I remove another ET. Maybe each of these K is partitioned into another K. So that naive bound will tell you it's order K squared, like applying the same argument twice. But turns out you can actually bound this by order K here. Okay, and this does not even require planarity. Okay, but, but the, the bound here is only different between k and k squared, so actually I'm not sure it's even worth mentioning this lemma at this kind of talk, but high level. But the second lemma is the important one. So now I take, suppose I take the union of all these cycles, which are all the cut sets. Um, and if you look at this picture in the plane, how many different pieces, and I remove these blue cycles now, how many different pieces do I get? So how many connected components or regions, I call it here, I have in this, in this uh, picture? And I argue that you only get something like two to the two K regions. Okay, so let me tell you the argument at the high level quickly. So I apologize if it's not very explicit, but it uh, can be formalized quite easily once you figure this out. You say, suppose I want to count the number of regions I have here. So, okay, let's look at these cycles. Now in these cycles, there are some vectors of degree two. These vectors of degree two are not interesting. Let's look at the vectors of degree strictly more than two. So you see the green vertices here. Some of them here are of degree two. I ignore them. But I want to care, I care about those of degree, say, four, or three and more, but, but typically it's going to be four, let's say. And I want to count how many, the sum of degrees of these vertices. Why? Because if I have here a vertex of degree, where is my mouse, my cursor? So if I have a, degree of, a vertex of degree four, basically it says, oh, near, me, near that vertex, I see four different regions. That's like an upper bound on the number of regions I, can, I have. So I'm going to count this over all vertices of degree greater, strictly greater than two. I want to sum up these degrees. Okay, so I'm ignoring vertices of degree two and then looking at sum of degrees. Every, every time I have such a thing, like this vertex of degree four, I say, well, this came from two cycles, S and T, because it's degree four. It's two cycles there, S and T. I want to charge it to S and T. So how many choices of S and T do I have? Two to the K choices for S, two to the K choices of T. And for each pair, I can only charge it something like order k times from because of the first lemma. Okay, that's uh, what you need to show. So this, I'm skipping that part, but it's basically by lemma one and then counting how many choices for s and how many choices for t. That's the whole argument. So you can see that it uses the planarity, the planar drawing, planar duality uh, to get an improved bound. And as I told you before, it was it's actually proven to be almost tight, like exponential in case tight. So uh, I would understand this one pretty much, pretty well, but we don't know how to do it for uh, excluded minor graphs. Okay, so moving on from, uh, if you remember from my previous slide about uh, this uh, uh, vertex specification, how can we relax it to, instead of being exact, we want to relax it to approximation. And what we know from this uh, sequence of theorems, so the first, paper was by Moitra and he suggested this uh, approach and then the bound was improved in a sequence of works. And it shows that if you have a graph G with K terminals, you can construct a graph G prime. This time, this G prime is really, really small. It's only on the K terminals, but you're paying in the approximation. So compared to mimicry networks, the approximation was one, but the graph was say of size two to the two to the K. Here I'm optimizing the other way around. I force the graph to be really, really the minimum possible, only in the K terminals, but I want the approximation to be as small as possible, the quality. We call it, in this context, it was called quality, but it's essentially approximation factor. So I want the minimum cut between any S and S prime to, uh, in G and in G prime, to uh, be a good approximation of each other. And this extends to a multi-commodity flow, and for planar graphs, actually, you can get better, but for general graphs, you have this bound, I didn't say, 
which is slightly better than log k. Very interesting that it's even slightly better than log k. And this gives you a sketch because this graph G prime has k vertices, k, right? It's only the k terminals. Of course, it has at most k squared edges. So basically, it represents all the two to the k cuts that you might be interested in using only k squared many words, but with some approximation, which is logarithmic. Okay, and uh, we don't know if this trade-off is optimal, but there is a lower bound for this concept, for these graphs. There is a, so it's not like about information theoretic, it's about this choice of a cut sparsifier. There's a lower bound of square root log k. So there's like a quadratic gap between the lower bound and the upper bound. All right, so, you know, this is very good, it was used for many things, and it kind of like begs the question, suppose I want better approximation. Oh, log k, square root log k, I'm, I'm still very interested in this question, but can you give a, a result for maybe in the restricted settings or uh, not a bigger sketch, not of size k squared, but a bigger sketch. By the way, for this result, I must say that if I remember correctly, as I said, I hinted, the lower bound is for these graphs. It's not about information theoretic. So I don't know if you can prove an information theoretic lower bound for this. For example, omega of k squared many bits that you need for, for these, uh, to represent all these cuts up to log approximation, log k approximation, right? So this means that you can say sparsify, like get a sparse graph from this or something like this. Okay, so we want to now look at, at better approximation and sort of like the goal, uh, the uh, best goal that we would like to have is something like one plus epsilon approximation, not, not logarithmic. So in a paper with Andoni and Gupta, we were able to prove something like this, like not something like one plus epsilon approx quality or approximation, but in a restricted setting of bipartite graphs. So uh, bipartite graphs means that you have the terminals on one side, you have the non-terminals on the other side, and the graph is bipartite between them. Okay, that's what it means here to be bipartite. And then we can reduce the size of the sparsifier to polynomial in K, compared to the general upper bound that we have, which is doubly exponential. Okay, so it's polynomial, it's like much, much better. Um, okay. And by the way, for this particular, for this family of graphs, there's a lower bound of two to the omega K as written here, if you want exact. So, so by going from exact to one plus epsilon approximation, I'm able to like improve the bit, the lower bound, which is exponential lower bound, getting a polynomial. So this one plus epsilon approximation really buys us a lot, which is very nice. Now there are other results uh, that depend on the, uh, not on K, on the number of terms, but on the capacity. So it might depend on N and I mentioned here, I'll try to speed up because I wanna just say a little bit about this proof. Uh, one more technical idea. So it's still open to, to do from uh, other families like planar graphs. Uh, maybe you, you do like for general graph, something like a non-graphical sketch or a lower bound. These are really interesting questions because most research is focused on this exact approximation one and not on one plus epsilon. Okay, so I wanna say a few words about this proof of this theorem. It basically works by sampling. And the natural way is to do edge sampling, like you do for edge sparsifier, you just sample every edge. But here it's not gonna work. So suppose you have this bipartite graph here, which I drew it in a different way. So you have the two terminals on, only two terminals on the, on the leftmost and the rightmost, and all the non-terminals in between. Now every flow path has length two. So if you sample edges independently, you're gonna break these flow paths. And that's gonna be very bad. And you can see it equivalently for cuts. We know flows and cuts are, uh, equivalent, right? So that's going to be very bad. Instead, what we want to sample is paths, flow paths. Now, this is a bit difficult because these paths are, are interacting in very complicated ways. Fortunately, because the graph is bipartite, that's what we needed to bipartite, we can replace it by sampling the vertices in the middle. So whenever I sample a vertex in the middle, I sample all its, uh, all the incident edges. So if I sample all the incident edges, I get all these paths of length two in between. Okay, so now I draw it like as a bipartite graph. So the terminal is K on the left, the non-terminals on the right. And I'm gonna sample the non-terminals on the right independently. Now, of course, if you sample a vertex, uh, then you want to reweight it with inverse proportion to the probability. That's very standard to have like an unbiased estimator. 
Now, but if you do it with uniform sampling, there's a problem that some vertices are more important, some are more redundant. So uh, some are less important because they're redundant and some are not. So you don't want to do uniform sampling because then, like in this picture, one vertex is not sampled, you're, you're dead. The connectivity goes to zero. So you want to choose the, the sampling probabilities, do it non-uniformly. Okay, so uh, basically the idea is to get give every vertex V, every non-terminal V, a sampling probability P sub V. And if you sample it, you give it a weight one over PV, which means all the edges incident to it are inflated by a factor of one over PV. Otherwise, deleted. Okay, now this is unbiased sample. Un unbiased expectation is correct, so it's unbiased sampling. And the interesting thing is that, like, this following property is that you have this mean cut in G of S. What happens in mean cut of S? So look at this picture. You have this S and S bar on the left because this is the partition of the terminals. On the right, you have the non terminals. Now, every vertex V, you have, the, think of it as a cut. You want to put it either on the side of S or on the side of S bar. The decision is, well, you either have to cut the edges going to S or cut the edges going to S bar. And if you do it, look at vertex V and you look at a different vertex V prime, they're non-interacting. So you optimize each one separately. Very simple. That's why the formula for the mean cut is basically summation of all, all the non-terminals, the minimum between two things. Which one do you want to cut? So these are like, sort of like linear edges. It's very convenient because the graph is bipartite. And if you do the sampling, then you get a similar formula, but with these uh, random variables that, you know, whether you chose V or not, indicator IV divided by V. And basically you choose, so I'm gonna wrap up here. So I basically, and, and skip a little bit of the details, but basically the idea is you wanna sample this using uh, probabilities that are proportional to the contribution. So if something contributes, like say, it's like the only vertex in the cut, then you have to take that. If some, in some cut you have many, like N vertices, then maybe you say, well, I can sample each one with probably one over N independently. I'm gonna get overall like right, uh, uh, on average or with high probability, I'm gonna get a good sample that rep representative. So you wanna do uh, what's called important sampling. So the first idea is to set PV proportional to how much it contributes. The problem is that this contribution depends on S and we have two to the K choices for S. So you wanna get around this. One fix PV independent of S. And then the second idea is that you can approximate this quantity, this contribution, what you want, by you looking, looking at single commodity flow. So instead of looking at S, capital S and, cap and bar, S bar, we look at a fixed, at every possible pair of terminals, S and T, and we think of like we wanna separate them. How much this vertex V has like the degree that it has to this S and to T, and it's a small calculation to show that up to factor k squared, uh, I approximate the importance. So basically we're gonna sample with these approximated importances inflated by k squared because we don't know, there's like an up to margin of error of factor k squared. So we're gonna sa over sample by factor of k squared and, and so on. So overall you get some sampling that are like various factors of k coming in, for example, from this uh, over sampling by k squared and we wanna take eventually union bound over two to the k cuts. So I want like a sort of like a churn of against two to the K, union bound against two to the K events. So I want a, a, another factor of K coming in, and but that's eventually the whole argument. So I want to end up by saying that this argument actually comes up in a different way. And this is about hypergraph specification that I mentioned in the beginning. So now it's not about vertex specification, it's about hypergraphs. And this is like the, the theorem I told you I have with, uh, I pulled with uh, Dima Kogan. So this is the statement of the theorem, um, and it's open to improve the bound from n squared that you see here to order n, like a wide open. And the reason it's related is basically because if you look at the, uh, at the bottom right of the picture, you can represent a hypergraph as a bipartite graph. You just put the vertices on the left, the edges, the hyper edges on the right, and now it looks like terminals and non-terminals in the vertex setting that I had before. So it's a little bit, going to be too quick, so I'm not going to go into the details, but it turns out to be almost the same setting. It's just, you want to keep only these vertices on the left and you want to uh, subsample the things on the right, and that's going to be exactly the same picture. There's a little bit of changing what's here in, the, in yellow, it's like the cost function is a little bit different. So that means that when you're doing the important sampling I mentioned before, the cost function is different, but it's only off by a factor of K or something. So same principles work, you can just work it out in this setting. 
the language is completely different, but it's the same principle, and you can directly translate one from the other, right? Just because a hypergraph you can represent as this bipartite graph. And this was actually done, but actually by Soma and Yoshida in 2019, they got the same bound, n squared over epsilon squared. Actually, they proved something much stronger because for spectral and directed. So it's not true that, it's not as I presented here that they, this is what they proved. It follows from what they proved. They actually proved something like n cubed for spectral, etc., like stronger than this. So it turns out these ideas somehow, you know, go back and forth between uh, different results. So I'm going to stop here the technical parts and, and wrap up. Um, I think the message that comes from this survey is that it's good to follow your scientific curiosity. You then find out interesting things that are somehow related to other things, either classical problems, either the problems you started with, either the problems you, you know, people studied in the 60s or whatever, you know, years ago. Uh, it could be like the classical problem you start with. It could be connection to like current technology, like streaming, deep networks, massive parallel computing. So all these connections are really, really interesting. So you should be always keep an eye for that. And I think on the topic of this talk, uh, I find it really, really fascinating that there is this interaction between combinatorics, problem, combinatorial problems that you want to solve, and sort of like information theory, like the sketch size, how much real information do you need? Is there like a trade-off with the approximation? Do you want to use graphs or use non-graphical representation? Are there connections between these cuts, distances, and flows? We know there are some LP duality, there are other connections. So these connections are, are also very important. And, and all these things uh, come up over and over again. And I think it uh, gives a beautiful picture. So I'll stop here and thank you very much. We thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Uh, let me at least applaud. Thank you. Um, questions. So you can either, if you are on Zoom, you can ask questions directly. If you are on YouTube, you can ask questions. Ah, oh, yeah, I, there is one. Kusha. Where did you start? Uh Hi, uh, thanks very much for the very nice talk. So for your information theoretic lower bound for epsilon approximate cut sparse fires, the n log n over epsilon squared uh, for bits, bit uh, length, um, is that a constructive uh, bound in the sense, or is it sort of proved by the probabilistic method that there exists a graph, but you don't know how to construct it? So, and if you can construct it, what do those graphs look like? Yeah, excellent question. So if you want to prove like a combinatorial brown bound on like a sparsifier, you can start by saying something. I start with a say, click, and every sparse of, sparsifier of it um, must be say, an expander. And then that graph must have many edges. So basically, the difficult graph is just one graph and an expander. That's a possible approach. But this is like the, was the corollary in my slide, which I can dig up, but I, let me not try to look for it. But the first theorem that I had, which is like information theoretic using bits, which is what you asked, really has to deal with an in distribution of the inputs because it's really about encoding. Any single graph, you can always encode by like one bit or something. So it really talks about a family of graphs that is difficult to encode, sort of like an encoding argument. And the way we did it in our paper was a, like complicated, but the second reference I gave there by Carlson et al. Basically, take something like you take a code in the space of all graphs of degree, I think something like one over epsilon squared. So just take all graphs of, of degree one over epsilon squared, and you prove that no two can be, no one can be a good sparsifier for the other one. And therefore, you cannot encode, each one requires its own encoding. And it becomes a, a once you prove this, it becomes a simple uh, counting argument. How many such graphs you have? So a code, I mean that mm -hmm. they only agree on so many edges. If you think of it as a, as a vector of zero one of like, you take the, the adjacency matrix, but you flatten it into a vector, something like this. It has to be like far enough in Hamming distance, basically. Thank you. Thanks. So it's a beautiful argument, but uh, yeah, in, in the second paper. You concentrated on undirected graphs. Are there related results on directed graphs? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I focused on, on undirected. There, I mentioned in uh, one of the slides there, directed. So I think people have not worked on it too much initially because it seems you cannot do anything in, in, for many of these problems. 
But then uh, a few years ago, one of the papers suggested like restricting the directed graphs so that the cuts going uh, are like out of S and the cuts going, the edge set going into S, the capacity is, is off by at most a factor of beta. So if it's undirected, it's beta is one, but there's like a bound, mm -hmm. a priori bound on this asymmetry of the cuts. And uh, using this information, you can actually get something where the question is whether it depends on linearly on beta, like the, the size of these objects. Depends linearly on beta, say, or square root on beta. And, and there's a result by uh, mentioned in one of these slides. Uh, I think Cheng, uh, Padigrai, and, uh, and Su, San, sorry. Um, and they're like mentioned another result there. So, so there are a few results. I think it's not well studied, basically we need to somehow restrict the control this asymmetry in the, in the directed graph. But once we control them, then there are good results. Thank you. Other questions? Just, just raise your hands, please, if you want to ask questions or just talk. Kusha, I had already. There's no other raised hand. Let me ask a, a second question, maybe. People are coming if I if I continue asking. Um, you listed, I don't know, 20 open problems. And I assume you think some of them are doable and some of them are impossible. What uh, what is your take on this? Well, yeah, okay. If, it was more, if I were more ambitious, I probably I would have uh, uh, given like, you know, a, a Rating like uh, Erdes, you know, like <laughs> all these problems. So I, I can mention there was the one, if you remember, that was like mentioned something about log, log over log log and square root log. There. Now that problem is very, very similar to something which is famous. So it's in direct, like direct connections, but I don't think it's like black box connection, but the same techniques, etc. For something in, in, in functional analysis in Banach spaces. And it's open from uh, since, since, I don't know, like the 70s, I think, or, or something, or 80s. So that one might be <laughs> difficult in that sense. On the other hand, you know, maybe if somebody like from our community looks at it from a different perspective, uh, which is, I think is simpler because of this combinatorial description, they might, you know, break this barrier and actually prove uh, amazing results for these uh, uh, Banach space people. So there is this option, but at the moment, this seems like a, a big barrier. The rest, I think they're, they're uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. I don't think like too many people have looked at them. We did not yet uh, find, you know, too, sophistic too sophisticated techniques. We can do better. I mean, I, the, these techniques I mentioned here were pretty simple. You know, in the papers, there are like some more, of course, but uh, I think we can, do, we can do them. I'm optimistic. What is the problem in Banach spaces and what is the connection? Uh, okay, it will take me to recall. The thing is that, that um, but I'll tell you the connection. So this problem about flow, cuts and flows, you can re rephrase by looking at sort of like LP dual as problems about distances. Mm -hmm. So like you have a graph and you have a subset of the vertices and you want to somehow represent the distances between the terminals. So between all vertices, using some like this is between the terminals, something, some connection between them with some approximation. And we look at this combinatorially. We have a set of vertices and graphs and stuff like that. In Banach spaces, this usually corresponds to a, like an n-dimensional space and inside it in, in, with some norm, not, not Euclidean norm, not, but some norm, and a k-dimensional subspace. So what we call like, we count like uh, vertices, they basically count the dimension of the linear subspace. And it's an analogous problem there. So, so you know, Banach space, it's about distances, right? The norm is a distance. But we look at graph distances, they're looking at, at, uh, at norms. But then the connection is, is very uh, direct. Okay. More questions? Any questions on the chat? David, any questions? I haven't seen think... any questions on the chat, but I think Kusha at the summit wants to. Ah, Kusha is a more. <laughs> uh, so um, it's, this one is maybe a, uh, a rather naive question. So uh, is it obvious that a 
cut uh, that a spectral sparse fire uh, sparse uh, sort of uh, I kind of I want to understand why is it obvious that spectral sparse fires are generalizations of cut sparse fires maybe th there's a simple explanation for why that is yeah yeah I skipped that because I didn't want to make it you know the talk like jump around but it's actually very simple so in a spectral uh, all the spectral things you basically take an arbitrary test vector x in Rn and usually you look at this Rayleigh really quotient x transpose Laplacian times x now if you restrict this vector x to be a zero one vector you get the case of cuts and that's a simple calculation so trust me on that but you can I mean so so out of all like infinitely many choices for x the two to the n choices are the like zero one vectors give you the cuts so it's like a superset of the requirement is like a superset of the requirements thanks yeah that was that's like a pervasive it happens in all the results so so that's why I you know opted to look at the simple version only so is it conceivable that one could prove for example better information theoretic lower bounds for the setting of spectral sparse fires or something like that so I mean it's not exactly the same setting I know because we were talking about all sets but um, I, I'm just kind of wondering in in terms of lower bounds whether sort of this stronger notion of sparsification might provide easier lower bound yeah so exactly actually the question you asked in the beginning about uh, so I mentioned this paper of Carlson et al so actually in the paper in their paper and also like uh, in my paper but in their paper they prove first a lower one for spectral specification so this is like for the stronger requirement and this is what I said it's really easy actually well, what I said before explanation about this code and stuff this really works for the spectral version and now if you want to prove a lower one against the cut version it's still true but now you have to work more because now you have to prove that every two graphs in your code really are different on some cut and this is like more difficult than proving that there is a test vector x that separates the, that they look different for some test vector x so that is like the uh, i'd say ingenious part in that short paper. it's a relatively short paper but that's the, the really beautiful part of, of their argument very very, very surprising so actually to go from this low one for spectral to low one for cuts so every time you know these um, beautiful techniques come up in a different place so that's one of them exactly this but so far like almost everything we know for cuts generalizes to spectral somehow like with with very limited loss in in like uh, you know size of the sketch or something like this going from banks or Carger to spectral specification of Spielman 10 and, and, and others so uh, this gives you hope that you know if we were clever we could prove the same thing but with spectral like upper bounding thanks more questions doesn't seem to be the case then let's thank our speaker once more i do clap my hands on behalf of everybody thank you very much bobby for this fascinating talk thank you very yeah. much court and everyone and the organizers and uh, you know go get a drink and come to the uh, business meeting yes right. the business is meeting is is about to start in uh, like 20 minutes it's uh, either the lix business meeting or the eatcs general assembly you should have the links uh, so it's you now separate, decide which community you a separate belong. zoom a separate zoom link these are separate zoom links yeah and they uh, yeah they are semi plenaries right so we are now splitting basically in the lix community and in the icap community oh, okay okay so see you around folks okay bye 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 yes. thank you everyone